All right, I'm going to go ahead and start. My name is Tom Wilhelm. Um, I'm actually not from around here. I'm from Colorado, so I don't know a lot of you guys, and you guys don't know me. So but one of the things that I wanted to do in the past was come out here, so I had an opportunity to do so. So here I am. Hi. What I'm going to do, you're going to stare at the screen for a bit because i got some uh, backstory to do. I've been in IT for about 15 years, and I've been in the security component for about half of that. Now, the company I was working for went through a remerger, and I, about a year and a half ago, I ended up being put in the penetration test team. The penetration? I did. I'll shorten that later because it's a mouthful and... Anyway, I don't have a drink up here. This <laughs> yeah, no pun intended. So anyway, yeah, you guys can edit that one out later. Um, so I didn't have any real experience with penetration testing. I had done a lot of higher level uh, stuff. I'd also worked in military intelligence, so I had to deal with a lot of managing security information but not necessarily doing from a pen test point of view. So what happened was, just like anybody else, when they are thrust into a new position, they try to get as much information about what they need to do so they can actually earn their paycheck. And the way I did that was, since there's this huge community of people who hack, I went to the Internet and I tried to learn as much as I could. As everybody knows, there's a huge amount of tools available to hack. I mean, you've got everything from Cisco hacks to web hacks, all these tools that allow you to do everything, except for there's not really any good scenarios. And that was the problem that I butted up against, was that I needed to learn how to actually hack against something without breaking any laws, because I wanted to keep my job. So what I did is I did what a lot of people suggest and that is set up a lab. Got to set up a lab. So what I did is I wanted something that was a little bit easier since this was kind of new to me. So what I did is I ended up loading up Windows NT. We all know there's a ton of opportunities there. So I loaded up WinNT and I loaded up um, a web server, IIS in this case, and I didn't throw any patches on there. Did all the things that a system is supposed to have other than their updates. So stood it up, loaded up Nessus, scanned it, sure enough, there's a ton of them. Went over to Metasploit, clicked a couple buttons, next thing I know, I had root. It's like, oh great, hey. Sat back and thought about it for a minute and I realized I learned absolutely nothing. So the reason why is because all I did was click and go. Click and you get root. So the next thing I did is I, I needed a, bit, a little bit more difficult task. So I ended up standing a um, more recent version. It was Red Hat in this case with all the patches and everything like that. So I started trying to hack it. Well, I didn't get anywhere. And the reason why I didn't get anywhere is because there was no exploitable vulnerabilities at that time for that particular version of Red Hat. So basically I was just hitting my head up against the wall it was too difficult for the skill set that I had, which was minimal for penetration testing. Now, as a result of that, I just said, you know what, labs don't work. There's nothing in between. There's no real good opportunities out there that anybody put together. So what I had was the advantage of the company that hired me to do the pen testing actually had servers for me to pen test again. So for the next six months or so, I just basically tried to drill down as hard as I could, learn as much as I could, as quickly as I could, and go from there. I mean, it was, it was a hard way to do things, but that wasn't the only option that I had. So six months later, I sat back and I started thinking about there should be a better way to do this. There shouldn't have to be this huge gap of information that you've got to leap across in order to be able to do your job in my case, actually get a paycheck for. Now, on my certs up here, you, gotta, you can see there's a bunch of them. It's not here to brag. What, what I want to show you is that there's a lot of Sun stuff in there. So my background was from a system administration side. 
Um, and it was also from a security cons uh, component as well. Um, so from that, what I'm about to get into is a direct result of my knowledge of systems. So here's some, I'm just going to start over again as to why it's a good thing to have a lab. Now I know I just said labs don't work. They don't. But it's still important to understand that you can't just go out and start hacking the internet. There's two people up here who have been um, seriously fined and they may not be the best examples of, of people who did things without malicious intent. But the fact of the matter is there are other stories where other people have had full investigations done and they've had to hire lawyers. Even if you are not guilty of doing anything wrong, it doesn't matter. The cost to clear your name is ridiculous. And if you're actually found guilty, you know, these kind of things can ruin your life. So it's really important that when you're trying to develop a skill set, you need to do it legally. Especially if you really don't know what you're doing to begin with, chances are you're going to increase your chances of actually getting caught. Now, also, there's some additional problems with pen testing over the internet. Um, one is uh, we got bandwidth problems. There's some, a lot of tools that you use include um, like brute force attacks, crunch up a lot of bandwidth. Uh, there's potentials for denial of service attacks. Um, you have a list here. There's also other things that once you start probing over the internet and hitting some of these servers that are in the back end, maybe through into a DMZ or something like that, there's still IDS um, systems out there trying to track what's going on. So when you're doing these brute force attacks, they'll shut you down. Or they'll start logging the information, and next thing you know, you get a knock on the door. Now, another thing is that ISPs have actually shut people down because of too much volume. It doesn't matter what they're doing. It's just too much volume. You, you're not qualified to have what we actually offer you. So even though you're paying for it, we're still going to yank it. So the problem is, is that those tools can get you in trouble even at a uh, lower level than getting hauled in by the FBI. Another thing is, there's time constraints. The, the internet's huge. What a lot of people do when they focus on, I want to learn how to do some web stuff. They'll, they'll focus on a particular exploit. So then they got to start scanning the internet for those particular exploits. Then they, hopefully, they, they'll eventually they'll find the server, but even that some, takes some time. If you have a lab, it's, it's there. It's ready to go full time. You don't have to even worry about an internet connection. So then there's been other scenarios where people say, well, I'll set up a server and I'll set up some exploits and you do the same thing and then we'll try to hack each other's box. Well, there's some problems with that is that sometimes your friend doesn't even know more than you do when it comes to setting up a good scenario. And then, of course, they're off at work or school and their system goes down and you can't access it and, you know, or they're on weekends. So it's, it's just a, it's a mess. I've tried that before and it just doesn't really work. And then also once somebody else finds out that you're doing this kind of a thing, they, they want to denial of service you. I don't know. It's kind of strange. So then really the question comes down to, so what? You're, you're not learning real world scenarios. You're just basically hacking against something that somebody else thought would be a good idea to set up. Uh, another problem about hacking over the internet is code of ethics. Uh, I've got a couple certs that if I am busted for anything, they're gone. And if they're gone, my employer's not going to be happy because that's one of the things that I have to maintain. So I want to keep the job, so I've got to keep it ethical. Now there's some disadvantages. Besides what I mentioned earlier about they don't really work. We'll, we'll fix that, though. They're expensive and expansive. The more systems you need. I mean, you can do a simple internal pen test where it's just you, a router, and another box. But what if you want to actually go through firewalls? What if you want to deal with trying to jump from a DMZ internally? Well, I mean, those kind of scenarios, you need extra equipment and you need to get, have them configured right. So next thing you know, you end up like me where my lab is in my bedroom and I've got nine systems 
four monitors, lots of routers, switches, all sorts of stuff, and my wife's not really happy because it's about 30 to 40 degrees hotter in there than any other room in the house. So it, what's that? Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing too. And the lights, you know, you gotta start figuring out how to disconnect those lights because for some reason systems like to have lights on at all times. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So anyway, it becomes a, a bit of an issue as far as trying to cram everything and make it work in a way that is convenient for you and your significant other or roommates. Um, you note know, everybody has the opportunity if they're trying to get into this to go down and you know just I have my my uh, work laptop and I can do jumps to our servers that we use to do our other jumps and do exploits and things like that. But nobody, nobody, not everybody has that opportunity. So you gotta end up pulling it in. And so it becomes difficult. And then let's say you wanna actually learn how to hack routers. I mean, you've got to go pick up that particular router. I mean, is a Cisco router? Are you doing firewalls? You gotta get a PIX, things like that. So the diversity really becomes up to you. That's the, one of the disadvantages of having a lab. There's PIX firewalls out there on the internet, not in your home. You know, so it's easier just to say, well, I'm gonna try to hack those and then, you know, instead of spending the money to get one for myself. So that's the disadvantage. The really big problem is how do you make a real world scenario? If you're gonna set up a lab and it's just you, what are you gonna do? You're gonna set up a box that you know the solution to. There's no no way you can surprise yourself. It's like playing chess with yourself. How are you gonna win? You know, you always win. That's the problem. You, you shouldn't be able to get it right away. And so you, you're re you have to rely on other people to put together scenarios that challenge you. Another disadvantage. So like I said, about six months after I started, I began to think, how can I make this a little bit easier and, and kind of expand this so others can not have to jam jump the same hurdle that I did? Well. I thought that there, whatever it was, it needed to be easy and it, it had to be a challenge for people with different skill sets. I also had to obviously simulate real world scenarios, um, fairly decent as far as uh, ease of creation. Um, and it, the portability would really be good too. I mean, if you're gonna have to set up a lab in your house, it's not easy to have friends come over and hey, I want you to try this. So if it could be portable, that would be great. Well, at that time, I had already known about live CDs, but I had discounted them. The reason why I discounted them is because there's a variety of different types of live CDs. There's distros to Linux, there's and other operating systems, BSD, stuff like that. There's backtrack, game, there's suggestions to make game servers. Um, there's some suggestions to use them as media servers. Well, what I did when any live CD that I actually kind of liked, and Backtrack was a good one, a good example, is I took it and it's like, yeah, that, that's pretty cool. I'll just put it on my hard drive and then throw the disc away. I mean, I don't need it anymore. So the, the actual concept of a live CD being quick to throw in and out and things like that, no, it's not worth it to me. I'll just, you know, um, just hook up Lilo. If I want it, I'll, I'll just you know, carve out different parts on my hard drive and throw whatever live CDs onto the hard drive. So they were kind of a cool thing, but not really useful. Now, when I started thinking about it, the CDs, live CDs, came back to me. It's like one of the problems that we encountered in, in the group was that, uh, that I was on was that if we ended up setting up any servers to do things, and there was a couple that we used, um, Foundstone, for example, you set up a server, a lot of people know this, you set up a server, you start screwing around, you break something, you may have to reload the server. And that's a pain. It, it takes too long, it, it just really cuts into your ability to start over and keep going with the flow. So that's why I said, you know, it makes perfect sense to go ahead and use live CDs for this concept of mine. Um, there's some additional advantages there's uh, less equipment needed. When I say that, a lot of times what people will do is they'll say, okay, I need to set up a 
a server, and it's going to have three different types of, li of Linux on there, and it's going to have Windows on there, and it's going to have BSD, and it's going to have all this other stuff. With a live CD, it's just a CD, you know, a few cents on the dollar. Uh, you don't have to have hard drives set up, and you don't have to have the, 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 the time involved to actually set this box up with multiple disks. Another advantage is it's obviously portable and compact. We, we talked about being able to take it anywhere with you. You can. Uh, and the biggest advantage is that these live CDs, when you do the distro, it's actually a working system. It's got, with a lot of these live CDs, you can drop in, you know, the whole, um, like the LAMP thing. You can have Linux on there with uh, Apache and MS, you know, MySQL on there, PHP. It's a full functional server. You want mail servers, you can set up these, these, sit, these disks to actually have all of that on there. So it, it's totally functional, whatever scenario you want. And they've got versions of all the different um, versions of the software that you're looking for. You want a different version of Apache or, you know, things like that. They have them. You can drop them onto the disk, and it's good to go. There's some disadvantages. You've got to know what you want to do. If you want to learn how to set up systems, a live CD is bad, because all you're going to do is reboot the system, and you're not going to learn anything. So if you're into it for the pen testing perspective, you don't care about the setting up of the server over and over again. Like with Boundstone, you know, you had to set up all those, like, .NET and, and the IIS and all that other stuff. You don't care sometimes about doing that. You just want the, the scenario. So if you're going to learn the sysadmin stuff, stick with the box. If you're going to want to do the pen, stuff, pen test stuff, try to get rid of some of that overhead. Um, now another disadvantage is that live CDs typically work off of modules. Uh, they're set up in a way that it, it's easily to drop onto the live CD. Uh, now there's some other ways. The problem is, is that there's not modules for every bit of software out there. Now there are programs out there that will convert programs, packages, into these modules. And you can use those. I've had some success with them. Sometimes I've just had to drop the application on there and run the installer as it boots up. Depends on this, the scenario. So there's some disadvantage. And the other thing is that you cannot make a live CD and distribute with proprietary operating systems like Microsoft. You can't do that. There are people who have tried to get around some of that using, um, you know, the, the like ability to test and things like that. Some of this but I'm not a lawyer, and, and it just seems like it's a bad idea to even try to, to do something like that. And there's also another OS out there that mimics or is actually um, has the same functionality of XP, I believe, but it's not actually Windows. They've taken the, the, the idea behind the kernels and then written their own programs. So when you're actually hacking that, you're not actually hacking a Windows box. So the fact of the matter is, is that these live CDs intended for distribution will not be able to use operating systems that are proprietary and have licenses that prohibit that. So I decided I'm going to go ahead and run with this. I wanted to make a live CD pen test lab. So I, I decided I needed some standards. I decided to go with Slacks. And the reason why I went with Slacks is because I was already comfortable with Backtrack. And, I, and being a Solaris guy, uh, Slack, Slackware actually had a lot more field of what a Solaris box is like than like Ubuntu. And I think it's just mostly because of GUI and stuff like that. But it's just, it, it's something that's ingrained and it's hard to break, but have bad habit to break. So I also needed to know what particular platform. I didn't want to have to create my own pen test platform. So I went with Backtrack and it only made sense. Somebody put together something, works great. I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. So I said, whatever I do as far as creating scenarios, I'm going to use Backtrack as a foundation. Uh, I needed a hardware router. I wanted to mimic a little bit of an actual network, and the router will provide um, DNS service and DHCP. Backtrack likes DHCP. Uh, I didn't want to have to make you guys try to reconfigure that. And then, you, obviously, you need two machines. Eventually, there's going to be some wireless pen testing lab, live CDs. So you'll need additional systems at that point. Um, 
but trying to keep it minimal, you need at least two high-speed systems like we got here. Some additional standards. This is something I kind of chewed on for a while. I had a problem. I wanted the live CDs also to be DHCP, but I realized that down the road, I would need to have set IP addresses if I was going to do any sort of communication between a client and a server, try to do man-in-the-middle attacks and things like that. So I decided I was just going to create the disks with fixed IP addresses. And I went with kind of a scenario. I figured that level one disks will be, um, meant, as you can see here, in the dot one dot whatever, and then the level twos. That's how you can distinguish what disk level you're at. We'll get into levels here in a second. Um, I also, this is something I'm, I expanded on. A to I'm expanding this topic. Um, originally, I had said that I preferred that people would use OSSTMM as a methodology to learn how to pen test or to do these disks. Well, I'll get into that a little bit more, but I decided to back away from OSSTMM and suggest people use the ISSAF. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, some disadvantages. Uh, the disks do not necessarily eliminate your need for equipment. If you want to have a PIX firewall, you still got to have a PIX firewall. Um, if, you, if you're going to be doing any sort of network penetration testing, you're going to have to have those components in there. Uh, in addition, you also still have to understand some basic routing protocols and, and understand how to set up a network and things like that. It's not extremely difficult. Um, but later on in some of the more advanced scenarios, there will definitely be a need to understand exactly how to, uh, DMZ should be set up. I'll try to obviously set that up as clear as possible, but there'll still be some need for an understanding of how that works. And then also, since you're using Backtrack, and a lot of the tools that you're going to use are going to be a command line, you need to understand some basic Unix commands. So let's talk a little bit about Slack. Slacks has, as you can see, they've got thousands of modules, like I mentioned before. They have different combinations of, like, if you just want Apache, you can get an Apache module. If you want Apache and PHP, you can do that. There's different combinations. Uh, they also have some pre-built ISOs. It's also released under new, and like I said, since it has a bit of a feel towards um, what a Solaris system might feel like, it's not necessarily user-friendly. Friend, uh, user friendly. Sorry. It, it's a little bit more, they expect you to know how to do system administration stuff before you actually do anything. So, if you don't like Slackware, they have, the, there's a linux-live.org. It's the same guy who sets up Slacks, which is the um, live CD version, compressed version of Slackware. He actually set up some scripts that you can use to, ver uh, to turn other versions of Linux into um, a live CD. And I think they even had some Windows stuff as well. Now, when I started actually putting together the live CD, this is how you're not supposed to do it. I'll get into it a little bit. Um, the file structure is typical as of a normal Unix system. It's got what you see there. Now, most people will notice that there are a couple extra directories. One's modules and one's root copy. Root copy is what I'm going to talk about. Root copy was intended early on by Slacks, maker of Slacks. He put that in there and he put that in there for people who were developing on Windows. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to load up your version of Slacks. You're supposed to make modifications to your operating system and then there are tools that will convert that into modules. And then you take that module and you drop it into a new version of your live CD. And that way it's there without having to deal with any of the other permissions problems that developing off of Windows presents. And there's some serious ones. I used root copy intentionally, even though I wasn't supposed to. I develop it per, uh, predominantly on Unix anyway. I still port it into that, that root copy directory. And the reason why I do that is because if you get my disks, and you drop it into your CD, not booting off of it, you can actually go into that directory and see everything that I did. And the reason why that's imp important is because under root copy, you'll see additional directories 
they, it's blank to begin with, but you can drop these in there. For example, um, Etsy password files, Etsy shadow files. If you want the people testing your live CDs to use the same login root tour that the live CDs use, you don't have to do anything. If you wanted to make it a challenge where they actually have to try to hack the passwords, you have to change the password file and the shadow file. I wanted people to see what I did and how it's designed so they could do it themselves. If you want sudoers added, you add it. If you want to do some RC local, RC local is a, basically it's a startup script that it's just an rc.d file, but it's, you can basically write it in any shell that you want to. But the rc.local file can take additional file, uh, additional things that you may not think of originally. For example, here I've got a snippet from one of the disks, and it uses IP tables. Now, that's an interesting concept. I mean, you have a lot of flexibility that you can drop into these disks that are outside of the normal way of doing things as far as modules. And so allowing people to see the disk, like I said, will allow them to make their own. In addition, hopefully it gives them additional ideas. Plus, if they really get stuck and they want to see what I did, it's there. They can see it. It's not encrypted. It's just open file. So I mentioned earlier there's levels. 